So welcome, everybody, to uh, Understanding Virtualized Memory Performance Management. My name is Kit Colbert, and I'm an engineer at VMware. I've done a lot of different stuff with memory and um, decided to start giving a talk about it. And I started this talk probably about uh, five VMworlds ago, four or five VMworlds ago. And it's evolved since then. <clears throat> so each year I try to add a bit more. Originally it started off um, with a few questions and just focus on the, the basic concepts of virtualized memory management. But now it's really taken on more of a performance focus. So I'd highly recommend that if you think this talk's interesting, um, some of the previous talks have a lot of good content as well. So the previous incarnation was called um, Understanding Host and Guest Memory Usage. So you can search for those on the uh, VMworld website. Okay, so today I want to talk about a few different things. The first is the motivation, why we're doing this, or why I'm giving this talk, what the important things to focus on are. <clears throat> then we'll dive into some concepts. And the concepts are what really underlie the rest of the talk. They'll provide the intellectual framework and the conceptual framework that we'll have for understanding how to best monitor and manage memory, as well as the best practices around memory management. Then we'll finish up with summary, and we should have some time at the end for Q&A. Okay, so why the motivation here? Well, you guys are all here for different reasons. Clearly, th this seems like an important topic for you. And there's a lot of different, uh, different performance concerns around memory, uh, setting the configuration memory, si the configured memory size. If you set it too small, then you will have performance impacts on your VM. But if you set it too large, you might waste memory, and you can actually impact other VMs' performance by setting it too large. How many VMs do you have on your ESX hosts? <clears throat> Having too many can clearly cause a performance problem, but if you have too few, then again, you're sort of wasting memory. So for both of these, there's sort of a fine line between these two different extremes to get best performance and optimal use of memory. And then there's a the memory reclamation technique. I think a lot of people believe that, um, you know, with certain workloads, like say Citrix or whatever, this is one I hear a lot, or used to hear a lot, that, you know, you shouldn't enable ballooning for that because it's worse for, for performance. But the reality is there's a lot of best practices and, you know, you want, as we'll see, you want to enable ballooning for all workloads. And so we'll um, take a look at that one in more detail. Okay, so let's get to then the questions. So these are probably the questions in the back of your mind, the reason for coming here. With the VM, how much memory should I give it? And what data should I use to make that decision? Right, there's all sorts of different metrics coming out. What do I look at? What do I look at? What do I ignore? It can be very overwhelming. How about an ESX host? How many VMs can I put on this host that I just bought? How do I understand that? How, I, how do I think about it? And then finally, with reclamation, what are the best techniques? How should I architect my system to ensure that I'll have the best performance uh, with memory, even if there needs to be some reclamation? So we'll try to answer all these questions throughout the talk. Okay, now, but before we can answer those questions, we have to get these concepts under our belts. Now, this is uh, listed as an advanced technical session. My hope is that uh, I'm starting pretty high level, but we'll dive in pretty quickly. Uh, if you have a question, uh, feel free to ask it you know, during the middle of the talk. Most likely, if you have the question, then probably many other people do as well. I'll only ask, especially for those way in the back, if you have a question, there are a couple of microphones here. If you can yell it loud enough that I can hear it, great, I can repeat it, but otherwise, you'll need to use the microphones. Okay, so again, starting off super simple before we dive headlong into this one. Memory size, uh, these are different terms that we're gonna talk about. So memory size, the total amount of memory presented to a guest operating system. That breaks down into two different components, allocated memory and free memory. Allocated memory, again, very simply, just the memory that has been assigned to applications. Free memory is the memory that has not been assigned to applications. Allocated memory itself can break down into two different types. Uh, that's active memory and idle memory. And so active is, of course, allocated memory that has been recently accessed or used or is being frequently accessed or used. And idle memory is allocated memory that is not recently accessed or used. Okay, again, very basic. But the, the concepts of active, idle, and free you should keep in the back of your head since we'll be coming back to them at a few different points in this talk. There's another visualization of that. So you can sort of see how it breaks down. I've done this for simplicity here. You know, in the real world, it's not like all your active memories in one place and all your idle memories in another place. It's really mixed up and completely jumbled. I've just shown it here for simplicity purposes. But again, these are the concepts. And I will also note that the concepts I use here, I've 
I only have 50 minutes to cover this material, which is fairly complex and fairly deep. And so what I've tried to do is to figure out the best way to articulate what I'm trying to say and get across the core concepts without getting into too much technical jargon or details, though this is, of course, technically deep. So I will simplify certain things that, that I think will not affect the, the overall presentation that will, and that will help us get to the uh, concept faster. So again, this is a simplification in some ways, but it's, it'll be a useful simplification, as we'll see. Now, let's start uh, going down the rabbit hole. So we have two different levels of memory. Uh, I showed you just one before and how there's get free and active and so forth. There's actually free and active and so forth in each of these levels. And there's two different levels because there's, there's essentially two different things managing memory. We have the actual hypervisor that manages the real physical RAM. And then we have the guest operating system, and that manages the virtual RAM. Now, keep in mind, the guest OS believes it's running on a physical machine. It doesn't know it's in a hypervisor. It doesn't know it's dealing with virtual RAM. So it just uses this, this little sandbox it has here however it sees fit. But of course, for things like performance and security, so that VMs can't read other VMs' memory and so forth, the hypervisor has to control that bottom level. So it controls how much memory is doled out. It controls which parts of the VM memory are actually mapped down into physical RAM and which parts are swapped or ballooned or so forth. So the hypervisor controls all that. Now, as I said, the guest OS has an allocator and so forth on the top level. It controls that. That size is the amount of configured memory that you've given the VM. The hypervisor controls what we call the host machine memory, and that is the physical RAM, and that's obviously sized to the number, you know, amount of DIMMs and so forth you put in the host, the, the actual real physical RAM. And as I said, the hypervisor actually controls those mappings between the two levels. So for instance, the guest may allocate a piece of memory, in this case, piece of memory 100 here, and it's up to the hypervisor to allocate a piece of memory at the uh, physical RAM and then create the mapping there. So the guest OS has no idea this is happening. It doesn't know that it's not really running on physical RAM. And as I said before, this allows the hypervisor to protect it, the VMs to get best performance and so on and so forth. It gives it this extra degree of abstraction. So two levels of memory. Now, a couple of important concepts here. Um, especially for performance. So the first concept is that of demand. And demand is essentially measuring how much memory a VM wants, how much it wants to actively use. And entitlement is how much physical RAM a VM can get. So this concept of entitlement is essentially the hypervisor figuring out, okay, I've got all these VMs running, you know, running on me. How much memory do I give to each of them? And how much it, it, it doles out is the entitlement. Now, it's not actually what the VM will use, but it's what it can use. So entitlement is what it wants, or I'm sorry, demand is what it wants to use, and entitlement is what it is allowed to use, the maximum it's allowed to use by the hypervisor. So that leads us to our first key concept. And that key concept is that a VM will achieve its best performance when entitlement is greater than demand. And this makes sense, right, if we think about it. Entitlement is how much physical RAM a VM gets. Demand is what the VM wants to use. It's essentially its, its working set, right? It's what it's trying to do. So, so long as that working set is in physical RAM, then it'll run as best as it can, right? So pretty simple. But this uses these new terms I have, entitlement and demand. Okay, so let's dig into this concept of entitlement. What is this? I've never heard it before. What does it mean? Well, as you can see here, each VM has some amount of configured memory, four gigabytes, say, in this case. But that doesn't mean that the hypervisor will necessarily give it all those four gigabytes. There may be other VMs running. They may have higher priorities. There may not be enough memory to go around. So that VM may only get a fraction of that. So the hypervisor has to figure out how much memory to give. And uh, this, this entitlement is essentially determined based on the relative priority with the other VMs. So how exactly is that calculated? All right, let's run through this. So there's a few familiar parameters I'm sure you know. Reservation, limit, and shares. Right, and configured memory size. These are all the basics. The other one is idle memory tax, which you may or may not have heard of. So it plays another important role. So reservation sets the minimum entitlement. So entitlement is a range, a potential range. The minimum, absolute minimum, is the reservation. The reservation is by default zero in vSphere, which means that the 
entitlement has a, by default, minimum of zero. Of course, you can increase that if you want uh, for a specific VM. Now, <clears throat> the maximum of entitlement is, is capped by the lower of configured memory size and the limit. And again, the default for limit is unlimited, meaning that the effective cap is the configured memory size. So, okay, those give us our two extremes, the low and the high. But the question is, how much does it actually get within those two extremes, right? Well, that's determined by shares and the idle memory tax. So the first thing the hypervisor will do, ESX and the, specifically the memory scheduler, it'll go through and allocate memory based on the shares. So it has some pool of memory, you know, six gig, eight gigs, whatever. It hands out the reservations first. It has some amount left. That amount left is divvied up based on shares. So it's given out proportionally. But then idle memory is taken into account. And what, what that is is a tax. So the hypervisor will actually take back entitlement from VMs that are not actively using all their memory and give it out to other ones that are. So let's work through an example here. This, this is a very simple example. Um, you'll notice that there's no idle memory on any of these, just to really simplify it. So we have VMs 1, 2, and 3. VMs 1 and 2 have a 4 gigabyte reservation. VM 3 has a 2 gigabyte reservation. VMs 1 and 2 have no, I'm sorry, memory size, pardon me. Um, VMs 1 and 2 have no reservation, and VM 3 has a 2 gigabyte reservation. Okay, so the hypervisor looks look at this situation and says, well, I see that VM 3 has got a 2 gigabyte reservation, so that's its minimum. Turns out its maximum is also two gigabytes, so there's no other option than two gigabytes, right? So it says, okay, I'll give two gigabytes to VM3. Now it has, it has six gigs total, so you subtract the two gigabytes for VM3, and now it has four gigabytes left. Four gigabytes for two VMs that both have four gigabytes. So, okay, well, they can't both get everything they want, so how do we dole out that memory? Well, we use shares and idle memory. You can see both the idle memory is zero, and VM1 actually has three times the shares of VM2. So what the hypervisor does, it takes that four gigs, and it says, okay, I'll give one megabyte to VM2 and three to VM1. And so it does that iteratively, right? Until you get to these entitlements of three gigabytes for VM1, three times the entitlement of VM2. So this is a very simple example, but this is exactly how ESX computes it, using this basic algorithm here. And thus, memory has been allocated, or I'm sorry, memory has been doled out in terms of entitlement to these different VMs. <clears throat> okay, so I, entitlement's great. It runs every few minutes, recalculates everything. Uh, but the key question here, because we're talking about performance, is what about reclamation? I see a question way in the back. Yeah, so the question is, okay, let's say you're talking about VM2 here, and um, you're looking from inside the VM. So you're, it's Windows VM, say, so you're in Windows, you're looking at Task Manager. So what's Task Manager going to say? Uh, it's very hard to say what Task Manager will say. It has a mind of its own. Um, I don't, I don't <laughs> not, not, about, not about Windows, but just about this general two-layer. So, uh, rem so remember what I said at the beginning. There's two different allocators at work here. There is the hypervisor level allocator, and there's the guest level allocator. The guest is completely free to do with this memory what it wants. It can take all that memory, give it to some application. It can take all that memory, use it as buffer cache. It can do whatever it wants, right? So exactly what task manager will show you doesn't equate at all to what you see from the hypervisor level, necessarily. If it does, it's a pure coincidence. But it's a, very diff it's a completely different view of the world, in fact, looking at the top level versus the bottom level. And that's exactly why I introduced that concept because there is no necessary, necessary correlation between the two. In previous iterations of this talk, that's one of the specific questions I set out to answer because it's a common misunderstanding and a common source of confusion. And it really is very confusing why these two things are so different. Uh, but it comes down to the fact there's two different allocators at work. The hypervisor is doing its thing, trying to ensure that it uh, stays by the policies that you set in terms of reservation limits and shares. And the guest OS is doing its thing, trying to make the best use of the memory it believes it has. So it may be the case that that VM is using all of its four gigabytes. That's great. It's only going to get one gigabyte in physical RAM. 
the other three will be either ballooned or transparently swapped out by ESX. So, good question. Okay. So, on to the reclamation techniques. Now, you're probably familiar with these techniques. In previous iterations of the talk, I go into much more depth on each of them, uh, particularly ballooning. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't have, I don't really have time to do that here, so please check out the previous versions if you're more, if you're interested in the how of these techniques. But for this conversation, I'm not so much interested in the how. I'm interested in the when and how much. So when, okay, well, transparent page sharing is always running, and uh, <clears throat> that's great, but it may or may not help, right, because transparent page sharing if you have large pages, uh, it's not turned on until you reach, um, well, anyway, it's a long story, but transparent paging isn't running all the time necessarily for large page case, and even if it is in small pages, you may or may not have pages that are identical, so it may or may not be very useful. So we want to focus our attention on ballooning, compression, and swapping. These are the other ways to reclaim memory, and they all have some level of performance overhead. Many times it can be negligible, as, you'll, as we'll see, but nevertheless, we only want to use them when we have to, right? We don't want to possibly incur a performance issue if we don't have to. So the question is when and how much, as I said. Okay, and before we can answer that, there's another concept here, and that is the concept of consumed. So consumed is how much physical RAM a VM actually has allocated to it. Now this is subtly different from entitlement. The entitlement is how much a VM is allowed to get a physical RAM. Consumed is how much it actually is getting, how much it's allocating. And that's to some degree up to the VM. What's the va that VM doing? Its entitlement may be a gigabyte, but maybe it only needs 400 megabytes, and so that's all it's going to grab, right? So consumed can be less than or equal to entitlement. And as we'll see, if it goes over entitlement, then it will be reclaimed. So <laughs> reclamation is actually based on entitlement and consumed. So if for some reason the VM just starts grabbing memory like crazy, it happens to go above entitlement, that is the amount that ESX will take back. So ESX is constantly watching the system, looking at how much each VM is consuming, and comparing that to its entitlement. So if consume goes greater than entitlement, that difference, that delta, is what is taken back. And as you can see here, ESX will first attempt to balloon it. If that doesn't work for some reason, then it will compress it. If it doesn't compress well, then it'll actually swap it out to disk. So consumed in entitlement. So that gives us our second key concept, which is that memory is reclaimed only when consumed is greater than entitlement. Okay. Now let's look at this in action. I like this little visualization here. So what I did was I plotted a few different um, metrics and then started a load generator. So you can see for the most, of, most part of it, uh, active, which is the closest thing we have to demand uh, in the base vSphere metrics, it's pretty low, right? I arbitrarily set a limit on it. It doesn't affect anything for a while. You can see consume there sitting. The, re the reason consume is actually above limit is because of overhead memory, so there's slight deviation there, but consume and limit are very close. Now, one thing you will see is that on the right-hand side there, active suddenly spikes up. Uh, the sentence I'm talking about is during... For reclamation, you mean? Yeah. You're a few, you're a few slides ahead of me, so you can go to sleep for a couple minutes, and uh, I won't repeat it, so uh, I'll keep it a surprise for everyone else. But, uh, <laughs> but no, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. But what I'm trying to do here is flesh out these concepts, and then we'll get to uh, the, the why of it here in a second. Okay. Yeah, so what we see on the right-hand side here is I've created an arbitrary limit, and I've then initiated a workload in here, which I know will go above that limit. And so you can see that, right? You can see how the blue line goes way above, and uh, you can see consumed actually react to it as well. You, you, see, you can see consumed sort of spike up. Now, you notice that for each spike up, there's immediate downward thrust. That downward thrust is reclamation in action. Right? ESX is watching this, and it says, hey, buddy, you're using too much memory, so I've got to take that back. So we see consume go up, goes back down, ESX reclaims it. But then the VM's still going hog wild, so it allocates more, and ES ESX says, no, I'm sorry, I need to take that back. And so you can see this, this thrashing, right? This is thrashing right here, 
where the VM wants more, ESX takes it back. The VM wants more, ESX takes it back. So this is the real impact of reclamation. If you try to make a VM too small or set a limit too small for a workload that really needs it, this is where that impact can come from, this memory getting moved around. So the full algorithm for reclamation looks like this. And this, again, this is run on an individual VM basis. So if consumed is greater than entitlement, that means that memory needs to be reclaimed. So there's certain scenarios here where we, we, we prefer to use ballooning. Ballooning is a default scenario where we inflate the balloon uh, by that difference. But if ballooning is not uh, enabled or running, or if we're just at a critically low amount of memory on the ESX host, then swapping, uh, or I'm sorry, compression and swapping are the way we go. So we try to compress. If the compression ratio is less than 50%, then um, ESX will swap. Now, on the flip side of that, let's say that you move some VMs off, or you increase the reservation, or what have you. Now, the entitlement will uh, actually increase and go back above consumed. So in that case, what, we, what ESX will do is actually give back memory. It says, well, VM, you're now using less than, uh, than you can, which means that I can give you back some of your balloon memory. We don't actually unswap memory until VMs need it, uh, but we will unballoon memory. Okay, now, getting to the gentleman's point uh, in the back there. Another term, memory over commitment. So memory over commitment is a simple si situation where the total amount of guest memory exceeds the amount of host memory that you have. The implication here is that not all VMs can get all the memory that they want, all the physical RAM that they want, right? There'll be some VMs that won't be able to get it. So now we can sort of put everything together. So if you are not memory over committed, all VMs will have an entitlement equal to either their limit or their configured memory size. If there is no limit, then all VMs will have an entitlement equivalent to their configured memory size. If that is the case, then there will be no need to balloon, compress, or swap, right? There will be no need to reclaim memory, even though transparent paging will always be running, and uh, it can, if it sees identical memory, share that. Now, on the flip side, if you are memory overcommitted, meaning you have more aggregate VM memory than host memory, then that necessarily means that one or more of your VMs will have their entitlements less than their configured memory size. And if that's the case, then ESX will have to reclaim at some points. And you can see the, the data there. So that leads us to our third key concept, and this is really the point uh, made earlier, the comment made earlier about Assuming that you have no limits set, consumed is greater than entitlement only when memory is overcommitted. So the second key concept was that reclamation only occurs when consumed is greater than entitlement. And we see here that consumed is greater than entitlement only when memory is overcommitted. We put them together. Uh, reclamation occurs only when memory is overcommitted, right? So that, that's the main takeaway there. Okay, so that's that section. Now they have these things under our belts. Got our heads starting to wrap around it. Uh, let's talk about monitoring and managing. Now, what I wanted to start off with is some don'ts. Before we get to the do's, let's get some don'ts in here. Stats not to use. Now, I know I've just been talking about consumed and consumed versus entitlement and so forth. I will say, though, that it's not a very useful indicator of performance by itself. Most people misuse it. And so that's why I'm sort of cautioning against it. If you truly understand and you know, really dig deep, and understand exactly what this thing's saying, then you can use it. But I would say, caution in general not to use it. Instead, the simple thing, as I'll say in a second, is just to use entitlement and demand and directly compare those two. Things like large pages and other things throw wrenches into how consume works. And frankly speaking, most of you should not be worried about ES ESX's allocation algorithms. You should be wor worried about how much demand your VMs have and how much entitlement they have. The rest takes care of itself. Now, the other point is about balloon memory. And as I'll talk about in the best practices section, uh, well, as I'll show some data for it, balloon memory is not necessarily a performance problem. Uh, but us, actually, I'm sorry, I'll talk about it right here. Let, let me dig into why that is. So performance issues with ballooning generally come from guest OS paging. Most people believe that ballooning and guest OS paging are synonymous, that they are one and the same, that when you have ballooning, you have guest OS paging. I'd like to say that is not the case, not at all. As a matter of fact, many times with ballooning, you don't have any guest OS paging. So let's look at a couple of examples. Now, what I've shown here uh, are now three levels of memory. We saw two before. There's three. You could argue these, I mean, in some ways, there's even more than this. Uh, but what we have is we have the hypervisor. We have the OS that's so allocated some data. 
and then we have um, some applications running inside of there, one of which is the balloon driver. Now, as I said to the uh, first question that was asked, I said that the VM handles the, its data, its memory, the way it wants. So it has touched this memory in the past, and, e and ESX has allocated it for that VM. Now that application may have finished with it, and so it's back on the guest OS's free list. So even though, it's hyper, even though it's allocated from the hypervisor's point of view, it's not from the guest OS's point of view. So when the balloon driver allocates that memory, well, that's great. The guest OS has a bunch of free memory to give, and um, there's no need to swap. So ballooning doesn't necessarily equate to swapping because the guest OS may have plenty of free memory that the hypervisor doesn't know about. And that's exactly what ballooning is for, is to make the hypervisor aware of that free memory. Now, there's another case, right? And that is the case where the guest OS is actually pretty strapped for memory. Maybe there's a big workload running inside of it. And so the balloon driver goes and allocates memory. Oh, well, now the guest OS needs to page. And so that would, or possibly, incur a performance problem or incur a performance hit. So the point here is that ballooning is not necessarily a problem. You don't want to look at the ballooning metrics by themselves because that's not indicative of a performance problem. It's possible, but it's also possible a big red herring. You don't want to confuse yourself with that. Yeah. Is there a metric that shows ballooning relative to the paging? Unfortunately, not. I do believe that <coughs> we have uh, ESX through the tools does actually collect paging data. I'm not sure for both Linux and Windows, um, but I think we have that data. Unfortunately, it's not exposed through any API that we can really get at very easily. Um, I will, what I will do as a best practice, and the best practice section is tell you how you can architect your system to see that. Um, essentially, well, I'll, I'll get to it in a second. So you can get to that, it's sort of indirect. Today we don't have any direct me uh, method of measuring it that's exposed through an API. But as I said, you can do it indirectly. Okay, so what not to use continued. I don't like to be negative, but I wanna get these uh, things out of the way here because this is common misconceptions. Swap out rate and swapped. These are other things people look at. They're like, well, memory's being swapped out right now. I'm like, yeah, great, but the performance problem doesn't happen when you swap out. The performance problem happens when you swap back in because the vCPU of the guest has to stall and wait. Uh, the entire vCPU is, is stalled until that swapping finishes. So just because memory's been swapped out or just because it's swapping out memory right this second, it doesn't actually mean there's a performance problem right now. You may be more at risk for one, but it doesn't indicate that the VM's suffering right this moment from a problem. So you say, okay, Kit, well, what about swap in right then? I mean, you said swap in's a problem. And yes, swap in is a problem, but it's how you measure that swap in. This swap in here is measured in terms of kilobytes per second. What's the throughput, the rate at which you're swapping in? And honestly, I'm not very concerned about that. I don't care if you're swapping in you know, a few bytes or many megabytes. My bigger concern is the latency. How much is VM getting held up waiting for those swap ins? Those two bytes could actually take a while depending on the storage system, right? So mem.latency actually measures the amount of time it takes rather than the, the rate or throughput. So I'll talk about that one in a second. But again, these swap, out, these swap in, swap out ones, I'm not too keen on because they can somewhat be, again, red herrings. So what do I advocate? Well, I advocate these metrics. Mem.entitlement, mem.active, mem.latency. These are the three basic ones. Active is the demand. As I said, it's the closest measurement we have. I work on a tool called VCOps, and we do a bunch more stuff in there to get a more accurate demand. Uh, but in the base vSphere, active is as close as it gets. So as I said before, you look at active, you look at entitlement. So long as entitlement's greater than active, you should be okay. Don't worry about consume, don't worry about large pages, don't worry about allocations. Those things typically figure themselves out. The other one to look at, another great indicator is latency, as I said. This is the real kicker, right? This is the one that actually fundamentally impacts that VM. If it's seeing memory latency, that means that it's waiting for swap-ins. That means its vCPUs are stopped. You're possibly getting some co-scheduling issues because the other vCPUs are stopped waiting for this one to catch up. This is where, this is the primary indicator of a real-time, right now, performance problem, m.latency. So that's the one I suggest looking at primarily. If you see there's a problem there, you can then look at active and say, well, is active greater than normal? If so, that means that the workload's having a spike or something's going on inside the VM more than likely. But if uh, entitlement is lower than normal, what that means is that there's contention, that the other VMs moved on to the system, something happened, and that's putting pressure on this VM. 
So those are the important metrics to use. Now, to this question before about uh, how do you see a guest's page rate, these are the metrics I recommend for that, virtual disk.read and virtual disk.write. So what you can actually do is put the guest's swap, or page, swap partition or page file on its own virtual disk. So create an extra virtual disk, extra VMDK, what have you, and solely put that one swap file, page file, on that disk. That way, any I.O. activity to that disk is swap and page activity from the VM. So this is a really cool way of being able to see what's happening inside the VM. Is ballooning actually causing a performance problem for this object or not? This is the way to see it. As I said, it's a little bit indirect. It'd be better if we could get the more direct value, but this is a good way of understanding what's going on. Now, on the host side, we have a few metrics as well. Mem.active, again. Uh, is this basically the summary of all the VMs Mem.active? Reserve capacity. Now, this is an interesting one. It's good to keep an eye on. Uh, the reality is that in order to run a VM, ESX needs something we call overhead memory, essentially metadata about that running VM. The amount of metadata that ESX needs can vary dynamically over time while that VM is running due to various runtime uh, considerations. And in order for ESX to actually modify the amount of overhead memory, it has to have some unreserved capacity. So you don't want to push reserve capacity up to 100% because then ESX can't dial up and down the overhead memory, and that can lead to performance problems. So I recommend reserve capacity, you know, 85, 90%. Don't push it too far. Give ESX a little bit of breathing room to optimize the performance of your VMs on the fly. So then we have mem.latency. The same thing again. This is looking at latency for all the VMs on the host together. Are they suffering? Or are a lot of them suffering? You know, this is a good way of understanding if there's pressure across the host or if it's just one VM that's having the issue. OK, and uh, there's a bunch of different ways of looking at this data. Many of you probably just use the vCenter performance tab. Um, some people probably or might use ESX Top. There's a good um, talk here on ESX Top and really getting into the details of it. As I said, I work on VC Ops, and so what we try to do is bake in a lot of this knowledge into it. And uh, we have a ton of different talks on VC Ops at this VM world. So check them out if you want. OK. So then on to best practices. So we got through the concepts. We got through the monitor and manage. Now let's actually get to how do you <clears throat> set this thing up and architect it best. OK, so let's focus on the VM first. We'll go to the host in a second. So for the VM, um, there's two things we want to do. We want to guard against what I call active memory reclamation, the working set reclamation. But if it is necessary, we want to make it as efficient as possible. So let's take a look at this one. So we have um, two different levels we need to be careful of, right? Again, I come back to this two-level thing. We have two different memory allocators. We have two different places where paging can happen. The first level is the OS level. So you need to make absolutely sure that your VM has enough configured memory such that the application running inside of it can use all the memory it needs to during its peak loads. So I would, I would size the VM's memory a bit more conservatively. You can make it bigger. Maybe you, know, you could err on the side of being bigger, I guess is the way I should say it. So you can look at the uh, average demand over time, just over the past few weeks, however long you want, and see what the, the peaks are, right? And then based off those peaks, you can make an estimation on sizing. Now, at the hypervisor level, we cast our minds back, we know that memories are claimed only when consumed is greater than entitlement. And so with entitlement, you also remember that, that the minimum for entitlement is the reservation. So what we want to do is keep entitlement greater than demand. So one way of doing that is keeping the reservation greater than demand. Right? That will guarantee that your VM will get the physical RAM that it wants to run as best it can. Now, with the reservation, you don't want to set it right as high as the configured memory size, necessarily, because as I said, with the configured memory size, you want to be a bit more conservative. You want to err on the side of being too big. With the reservation, I would argue that you might want to err, if you have to, more on the size of being a little bit too small, depending on your SLA, of course. If your SLA is super high and you want to make sure your VM gets this memory, then you could be, again, conservative on the reservation as well, uh, conservatively high. But nevertheless, you should base the reservation off the average demand. And that will ensure that most of the time, your VM will get what it wants, and hopefully ESX should be able to accommodate the spikes, assuming that you can set um, shares and so forth properly. So OK, so that's sizing the VMs. Again, demand is a key indicator to use here. And that's mem.active uh, if you're using um, you know, the vCenter performance tab charts. 
Okay, now, as I said before, there's a lot of this confusion over ballooning versus swapping. Is ballooning always the best thing to use? Should I disable it and just use hypervisor-level swapping? So let's look at some real data. We can hem and haw about it, but the data can tell us pretty clearly. So this is a pretty busy graph here, um, but the key things to look at are, first, that this is a swing bench application. It's a load generator for Oracle. It's four gigabytes in size. Now, on the x-axis, what I've shown here is the memory limit. The memory limit's actually going down from four gigabytes all the way down to uh, 1.5 gigabytes. So this is, a, this is effectively capping how much memory this application can use. On the y-axis, we see the normalized throughput. So one being optimal throughput, and then obviously going down below that. The purple line is with ballooning enabled only, and the orange line is with swapping enabled only. So this is, you know, pretty self-explanatory. You see swapping take an immediate nosedive. So why is that? Why, and like, well, not only that, but look at ballooning. I mean, ballooning's close to one or 100%. I mean, maybe down to like 95% at times. But generally speaking, even though we ballooned away almost a gigabyte and a half or so, the, the application is still running perfectly fine. There's no performance impact yet. So it's actually because of the fact that the guest has plenty of free memory, and the, the balloon driver is reclaiming that slowly over time. So even though, this is a four gigabyte VM. It actually, the working set only, you know, of the application is much smaller. It's more like two gigabytes. So we can actually balloon back a bunch of memory without impacting the performance of the application. So again, ballooning doesn't always equate uh, to performance problems. And generally speaking, ballooning is almost always faster and less of a performance impact than swapping. So. What does that tell us? Well, it leads us to the first best practices. Around ballooning, install the VMware tools on all your VMs, enable ballooning on all of them, regardless of the workload. Ballooning is the thing that you want first. Now, when you're doing that, do be sure to, to have enough swap space inside the guest in case it does need to swap. As I said, much, much of the time, ballooning will just reclaim free memory from the guest and give that back to the hypervisor to reuse. But if the guest OS does need to balloon, you should be sure that I'm sorry, if it needs to swap, you should be sure that the guest has sufficient swap space. You know, you may have heard of Linux. So we, what Linux does, as a very evolved operating system should, when it runs out of memory and there's no swap space left, it starts randomly killing processes. And um, an earlier version of Linux would sometimes kill process zero, the init process, which would bring down the whole server. So, <laughs> good for it. It fixed that, luckily. But that, that's just one point that uh, you really want to make sure that your swap space is sized correctly. And this is something that's easy to overlook. You go into vCenter and you're like, oh, let's make it 16 gigs instead of eight. And then you forget to adjust the swap file size when you do that. It's an easy thing to forget. And as I said before, it's a good practice, at least in my view, to put the swap file on a separate virtual disk so you can see from Virtual Center how much swapping is going on inside the VM. So you can get that sort of view inside the VM. And that will be a good way of, of telling you, you know, is ballooning putting pressure on this thing? And is that VM actually suffering internally from swapping? OK, so that's ballooning. Now, you may have noticed that I've been a little sneaky here. And I have blocked out the right side of this graph. So let's see what happens if we remove that, uh, that overlay. OK, then ballooning takes a nosedive. <coughs> so, Ballooning is not a panacea, obviously. Even it can succumb to performance issues. And why is that? Well, it's because of the fact that we have now hit a memory limit so low that the demand of the VM is actually now exceeding the entitlement, right? This rule number one that we're violating. All the active memory for the VM, all the working set, cannot be kept in physical RAM, and thus you can see it starting to degrade. This is exactly that sort of thrashing scenario I showed earlier. This is the outcome of it in terms of performance. You can see the, the uh, downward fall there. And that downward fall is very, very quick. I mean, look at that. Just a few data points before, we were totally fine, and then we immediately started diving down. So once you start touching that working set, that's where the real pain begins. And that's why it's really important to understand what the demand is and to make sure that your entitlement is large enough to satisfy that demand. All right, so let's move to the host. So we talked about the VM. We know about ballooning and so forth, those best practices. What about the host? Now, with the host, as we said before, at the beginning of the talk, you want to add as many VMs as possible. But at the same time, you don't want to add so many that you will actually impact VM performance, right? You want to keep your VMs happy and running. Now, 
Um, in order to understand this, I want to dig in a bit on this, mem uh, this concept of memory over commitment. There's two types, in my view. There's what I call consumed memory over commitment, which is what we th usually think of as memory over commitment. It's just the total amount of configured VM memory, the sum of all those VMs config memory, divided by the host's memory. But there's another type, and that's what I call active memory over commit, or de memory demand over commit. And that's the sum, the sum of the VMs mem.active, what they're actually really using or demanding, divided by the host capacity. And the implication, the difference between these, the implications are huge, right? Because with configured memory over commitment, that's perfectly fine if you have that being greater than one, where you have more VM memory than there is host memory. That's perfectly fine. Generally speaking, there'll be zero to negligible performance impact. And why is that? Well, because it can reclaim from all that free memory inside the VM. That's what ballooning does. That's why we love it so much. But at the same time, if you try to push active memory over commitment too high, then you're guaranteed performance problems, as we saw with that nosedive. Because once you push it too high, your entitlements will sink below your demands, and then we have your problem. So, you know, with active memory over commitment, it's better to, you know, keep it much more conservative, 50%, 60%, 70%. Something in there, while configured memory over commitment, you can take it much higher above one. So let's dive into this a little bit more. So, with configured memory over commitment, we see that, uh, actually, taking a step back, so again, free, idle, active. These are the same terms we talked about initially. So, you see that some of the free and some of the idle memory has been reclaimed. It's no longer in physical RAM. But that's okay, uh, because all of the active memory is still in physical RAM, and so our VMs stay happy. They can run at their peak performance. But with active memory over commitment, what we see is that all of the idle and free memory has been ballooned out and reclaimed. And not only that, some of the active memory has as well. So with active memory over commitment, what that means is that, as I said, entitlement is less than demand. You get the thrashing we saw. You get the performance degradation we saw with that swing bench app. OK, so as I said, you want to keep configured memory over commitment, or you can keep memory, configured memory over commitment greater than one. That's really optimizing the use of that physical RAM, the value of that RAM. At the same time, you want to watch active memory over commitment. Keep that less than one. You know, it's wherever you feel comfortable. I said 70% here. Some of you may feel more comfortable at 50% to handle spikes and so forth. It's really up to you and what your workloads look like. But it all goes back to this demand and entitlement comparison. And this is why I keep harping on it, because these are the two most important things when you're thinking about sizing demand and entitlement. OK, so that's great. We can pack them on. But uh, let's make sure we don't impact VM performance. Now, ideally, we don't need to ever reclaim memory. But there may be cases where we do, so let's make it fast. Transparent page sharing, as I said, is always running. But sometimes uh, it doesn't do quite as much as we want. So we may need to go in balloon memory. And uh, as I said with ballooning, many times you're just getting that free memory inside the guest, thus there's really no or very little overhead to doing it. But ballooning may not be fast enough, in which case we have to swap. And swap is great, except for the fact that uh, spinning disks are really slow. So can we do something else about it? Is there a question there? At one point, do you want to start looking at adding another host? So that's a good question. Um, I would say that, again, looking at a single host, well, so actually do it this way. So take your VMs, uh, add up all their demands, and see where that gets you, right? And then look at your hosts. How much memory does your host have? Can that accommodate those demands with some headroom? Let's say, again, you're going for your 60% or so uh, threshold. If not, then you start adding more. But essentially, the, the amount of uh, host memory that you need you basically you can multiply that by your threshold, 60%, 70%, whatever I said, and then compare that to your aggregate VM demand, what, you, what you're seeing from those VMs. And that's sort of how you figure out when to add more hosts or not. I've now, I've now lost you, but the person asking the question. Oh, there you are. Okay. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so spinning disks are very slow. What can we do? Well, as I talked about, we can first compress the memory. And we'll look into that one in a second. But uh, sometimes memory doesn't compress very well. For whatever reason, it's really dense, and co the compression ratio isn't very good. So we have also now have SSDs as a cache in front of the spinning disk to give you some more performance. So let's talk about uh, compression first. So here's the data on compression. Same situation as before. We have Swingbench. This time it's 16 different VMs. 
80 gigs of memory. You can see along the x-axis, the host memory size itself is actually decreasing over time. And then you can see on the y-axis normalized throughput. Uh, the orange is no memory compression. The purple is memory compression. And so you can see the savings that you get there, right? That as um, swapping really takes a nosedive, you're sort of st still able to kind of stay afloat uh, with compression. So again, compression is preferable to swapping, and you want to configure it. Now, SSD. So the, th the thing with SSD, or actually the thing with spinning disks, is that they operate on the order of milliseconds in terms of latency, where memory operates on the order of nanoseconds. And so you say, great, that is like 10 orders of magnitude difference. Fantastic. You know, I need something in the middle to help me with this. And that's where SSDs come in. Unfortunately, I could not find an icon of an SSD, so I use this. It's all flash. I'm an engineer. I don't, I don't know what's going on. So, <laughs> so anyway, you get the picture, right? SSDs and flash are in microseconds. Those sort of read times, you know, three microseconds, 10 microseconds, that sort of order of what we're talking about here, sometimes a little bit longer. But the point is it gives you a little bit of breathing room in between there. So you're not going straight to the spinning disk and waiting milliseconds. You can get stuff back in microseconds. Now, the notion here is that we don't want to put the entire swap file on the SSD. SSDs are still very expensive. So we want to make the best use of it that we can. So what we've done is we've actually implemented what we call a host cache. So for a single ESX host, you can specify an SSD that will act as a cache for all the VMs on that host. And that cache can be sized to whatever you want it to be. It does not have to be any particular size. You could have a 100 gigabyte host with a 5 gigabyte cache, a 2 gigabyte cache, a 1 megabyte cache, whatever you want. You, know? you can specify that and configure it. And so what happens is that one a VM needs to swap out, We'll swap it out through the SSD, write it down to the disk as well. And when the VM needs to read it back in, so long as that data is still in the cache, then we'll read it back out of the cache instead of going down to the spinning disk, thus making things much, much faster. And so we can actually plot that and see. So again, similar graph here. You should be used to it by now. And we see here the purple is uh, with the host cache, and the orange is without. So again, you can see the performance benefits that you get from leveraging that, that SSD. This gives you that faster response, less latency, and the application is able to perform better. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide that actually puts everything together, you know, ballooning and compression and SSD and so forth. But what these are all sort of diffs. And so you can see how they could add up, though, to create tremendous savings and performance improvements if they're all implemented together. OK, so with that, we're now to the summary. So let's cast our minds way back to the beginning here. Uh, to the concepts. A VM will achieve its best performance when entitlement is greater than demand. I harped on this one quite a bit. Entitlement is the VM's fair share of hypervisor memory based on the relative priority with other VMs. We talked about how ESX decides how to dole out that, those memory um, entitlements. Demand is what the VM actually wants. It's what it needs to actually get its best performance. The second key concept was that memory is reclaimed only when consumed is greater than entitlement. And the third one was, assuming no limits are set, consumers greater than entitlement only when memory is overcommitted. So memory is reclaimed only when memory is overcommitted. Now to monitor, we talked about the important stats. Entitlement, active latency uh, for a VM, as well as active latency and reserve capacity for a host. And I plug my own product there. Very good. <coughs> so then we have VM memory. And the best practices here are that you want to size your VM just right. So the configured memory size of the VM should be fairly conservative. Err on the bigger side. Using demand. Look for those peaks in demand. Because there's nothing the host can do, the hypervisor can do, if your VM is just too small. Nothing from a performance standpoint. You have to make that VM bigger. That's all, that's all that can happen. On the flip side, you want to ensure that it'll run well on the host and get enough physical RAM. So you also want to set the reservation. You set the reservation to more of the average of the demand rather than the peaks. And then, as I said, you want to install the balloon driver, uh, I'm sorry, tools, enable the balloon driver, and so forth within the VM. On the host side, we talked about adding as many VMs as possible. We talked this, about this concept of configured memory over commitment and how it's OK to have that be greater than one. You know, people always say, oh, overcommitment leads to bad performance. And I say, no, it depends on the type of overcommitment. Configured memory over commitment is just fine. You've seen how the reclamation techniques here can help, especially with ballooning. There can be almost no performance impact from that. Where you do get a performance impact and where overcommitment does cause a problem is with active memory overcommitment. And that distinction is really vital. 
right? So when the total amount of demand exceeds the ability for the host to put that in physical RAM, that's when VMs start suffering. So you want to make sure that your active memory overcommitment is less than one. You know, again, 50%, 60%, 70%, whatever you feel comfortable with. And as a best practice, enable compression. It's just a you know, checkbox, basically, I think. And all, all the new machines you buy, I think a lot of them include SSDs now, so it's fairly easy with vSphere 5 to set that up as a host cache. You go through and configure each, via, um, sorry, each host uh, for, uh, with that. So the question is, does that SSD have to be used exclusively as a cache, or can it be used for other things? And the answer, I believe, is that no, it does not need to be used exclusively. You can actually specify the size uh, that you want to use as a cache. You could probably use the rest as VMFS or, or what have you for your VMs. You know, I'm pretty sure you have that option. Yeah? That's a great question. Where is the checkbox for memory compression? Is it an advanced option? Yeah. I think maybe it's, maybe you don't, maybe it's just on, off, on by default. It's okay. I'm hearing confirmation that it's on by default. So you, you do nothing, actually, and you get it. <laughs> just upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. So the question is <clears throat> about around active memory and its applicability across workloads. So active memory is a metric that is computed by uh, ESX, by the memory scheduler, and it's computed on a statistical sampling basis. So what it does is essentially, you look at the VM's memory, you have however much, you know, many gigabytes of memory. It selects essentially 100 pages of that memory randomly and marks them as inaccessible. And so if the VM tries to access them, we'll get a page fault. Uh, telling us that the VM just tried to access that page. And of course, we mark it right or readable and let the VM go do its thing. But what that tells us is that over a minute, we can see what percentage of those 100 pages are being touched by a VM. Now, we continue that every minute, looking at a, every time a different random sampling of a memory. And over time, we get this rolling average of what the average percentage of touched memory is. And that's essentially what mem.active is. And we can do that over one minute, five minute, 15 minute period. We do some different weightings to try and... Anyway, there's a bunch of details there. But the notion is that it's based on actual access to memory over a period of time, right? Now, the question is, how long of a period of time? You know, when you talk about working set and uh, performance around working set, working set always has an implied time interval. Working set is a rate. It can be per second, it can be per minute, it can be per hour. So what do you define your working set as? So with active memory, the working set, you know, as I said, we have one, five, 15-minute granularity. You sort of weight those two a little bit, or three to get the final number that you see in the UI and stuff, mem.active. Now, for workloads, you mentioned Exchange. Uh, SQL Server and you know, SQL in general databases, as well as Java even, have these sort of properties where that a lot of times it may actually be best to measure their working set over hours or sometimes even days to get a true estimation of what they want. Now, particularly, you're talking about Exchange, and I've seen this more with SQL myself, actually, where what they do is they cache an insane amount of uh, data in memory. And what they assume is that they're not going to use it very often, but when they use it, they assume it's going to be very fast because it's in physical RAM. Of course, they're running in a virtual machine, and that's not necessarily true. So for those applications, we do have um, some issues with active in the sense that it's not, 100, or it's not quite as accurate as we would like. So we are working on trying to improve that, uh, improving the, the, the sampling technique, possibly looking at, looking at um, I'm sorry, longer time frames and time intervals in order to get a better understanding of what the VM truly wants or needs for best performance. So yeah, so I, that's a great point. So for certain types of workloads like SQL, Exchange, and even sometimes with Java, I've seen this as well, you do want to just double check and make sure that um, that is the right number that you're seeing. Yeah. How do you size for those workloads? <clears throat> that gets more complicated. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, well, believing the OS isn't the best deal either. 
So that's one thing, yeah. So that, you know, this stuff is more of an art than a science in some ways, right? Because there's so many different possibilities. What I've given you is one recipe for looking at it. Now, what we've seen is that it doesn't work for 100% of the use cases. And um, I mean, so you certainly could take a look at it and see what the numbers come out using Active for this you know, SQL workload, Oracle workload, what have you. Many times that could be a little bit low. Um, so in that case, you'll need to work. You know, I mean, you'll have to work with the, the VM owner, the DBA, or whoever might have some better knowledge about it. That, that does not mean you should actually just use what's in the guest OS. Many times it's not very accurate. If possible, if the guests, and I'm not sure how Windows and Linux do this, but looking for that sort of equivalent of active, and I don't know active memory, I don't know if they have those in Windows and Linux, um, but that, that's sort of what I would do. Yeah. That's a good question. So the question is, okay, so the SSD is a cache. What would happen if you vMotion off that host with the cache? So um, I'm not 100% sure if we actually would copy that or not. It's possible that we would, um, but I don't actually know the behavior. You don't need it. No, no, no. So let's be clear. For, um, for functionality purposes and correctness purposes, you do not need it because it is a copy. The canonical real data is sitting on the spinning disk in the back end. So if you assume you have shared storage and you have a swap file in your shared storage, the other host will see that data. Now, the, the question I was thinking about was more around the performance aspect. Will we read it out of there and put it in the other one? I, I, if I had to guess, I would say I would doubt it, but I'm honestly not 100% sure about the implementation. Yeah. Quick rule about size in the SSD. So that's... Um, it's a good question. I haven't thought too much about that one yet. So I would say, actually, no, I'm sorry. I don't have any <laughs> good suggestions. Uh, I must might lead you, lead you askew with anything I say. That's a great question. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. Yes, yes. Okay, another very good question around, um, you're looking at the, um, well, anything actually in vCenter. You're looking at the summary page, anything, summary page for an object, a cluster, a host, a VM, or you're looking at a cluster and you're looking at your list of hosts and you see, and all those things you have like these bar for memory, right? And it's like green and eventually gets yellow and gets red. So how does that compare to all this? So unfortunately, they, within the vCenter team, primarily use consumed for all those visualizations the exact metric I told you not to look at. <clears throat> so that's a bit of an issue there, right? So what we have been working with them, training them, because, you know, to be, to be fair, these guys are not performance engineers, and they don't understand a lot of the details about this stuff. And so I'm working with them, and well, many people are working with them from the ESX side as well, to try and get the right stats there. So I think either, um, I don't think it's in 5.0, but I think 5.1 maybe, they have started to add active memory below, uh, wherever you see consume, you, usually, you should have active memory there too. Consumed is just a bad metric to look at. And you know, the whole thing with large pages, when you went to Nehalem and you started enabling large pages, that just made consume go crazy, right? And that affected a lot of people precisely because of the fact that we're showing consumed in all these screens. Had we been showing demand and entitlement, no one would have noticed um, because it's purely an allocation problem and, and, or an issue, not a problem, and it, and it doesn't affect a lot of things. So in any case, unfortunately, yes. The vCenter UI, you have to be a little bit careful about that because it will show consumed in a lot of places. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think I have time for one or two more. Memory demand? Uh, no, so memory demand, not in, not in vCenter and ESX. Uh, the closest you have is memory active. So memory active is sort of a proxy for memory demand. Now in vCOS, we do some stuff to try and estimate what we think memory demand actually is. Um, but in vCenter, it's just active. So that's what, that's what you can use as a sort of poor man's demand. Any last question? Okay, I'm available afterwards as well if you want to ping me one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. All right, thank you.